Good morning, church family. Go ahead and have a seat if you would. I want to speak a blessing over you today. I want to speak into your life as we continue this theme of replanting and what that looks like. I want us to hear the heart of God this morning. I want us to be stirred by his Holy Spirit, and I want us to believe that he wants to do more in us, but more importantly, he wants to do more through us. Congratulations, it is the 9 a.m. service. You are officially the best of the best of the church. You're better than those that sleep in till 11 o'clock. You are the brightest in your class. You are a star athlete. What's everybody laughing for? Dusting off my shirt. You have the wisdom of Solomon. You have all of those things. And you know what? Although you have all of those things, God can still use you. I promise he can. But you might recognize that all the way throughout Scripture that God has a habit of using just ordinary, everyday people. This series, this replant of a church is specific to those who believe that God can use them. It's specific for those who believe deep down that they were created for something more, that we were born with a purpose, that we were created by God to do something eternal, something that matters, something that lasts. And as we replant as a church, if you're open to what the Spirit of God would say to you, I believe God will speak directly to all of us today. I believe that if we step out on faith, we can do something that far outlasts us when we're gone and living in God's grace. I believe God's going to speak very directly to some of us. But I want to warn you about something. I want to warn you about what happens when God starts speaking into your life and you start living out the life that God has called you to do, I want to warn you that the price will be greater than you can ever imagine. You'll you'll very likely experience pain, agony, rejection, heartache, and failure, and loneliness, and doubt, and occasional bouts of discouragement. Woo! Woo! Yeah, right? That's exciting, isn't it? There are times that you might have to stand alone, times where people will be laughing at you, not with you, times where people will misunderstand your heart, times that will feel strange, times that will be just difficult in your everyday life, but when your sacrifices impact lives around you and glorify God, promise you, you'll not worry about the price that it costs you. There will come a day when the gospel and the things that Jesus stands for will become illegal for us to talk about. There will become a day, and the day is here now, when the church will be persecuted. And when I say the church, I talk about the North American church. But don't let that discourage you. Let that give you strength because a persecuted church is a growing church. Because of your faithfulness, God will be honored and people will be changed eternally. People will come to a saving relationship with Jesus Christ, not because of you, rather because of the Holy Spirit that's leading, guiding, and directing your steps, your thoughts, your words, and your vision. So you may look like an ordinary, everyday person, 
You may not feel exceptionally gifted or talented, but you are the exact person that our God loves to use. And I want us to look at an ordinary man doing an extraordinary work. An ordinary man named Nehemiah who had a broken heart for the plight of his people. And he looked at the situation of his people and he decided, you know what? I can't sit by and just hear about this and do nothing about it. Somebody has to do something. It might as well be me. If you have your Bibles, open them up to Nehemiah, page 497. (laughs) Or open them up and look in your Bible app. That would be different yeah let's go to page 497 you'll be good I'll mispronounce everything so bad you won't know you're not there anyway (laughs) but something stands out in Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 18 it's the end of the verse and something stands out here that that I want us to see Nehemiah 2 18 tells us it says it says so they put their hands to the good work I were to title this message this morning, I would entitle it, Let's Get Back to Work. And if you have faith to believe that God might speak to you and stir your hearts even more, would you just join me in prayer this morning? Bow your heads, close your eyes, and stand for me if you would. I hear bones popping and other things going on. Father, we ask that your Holy Spirit would stir us to believe that we could do exceedingly and abundantly more, God. By your power, Lord, to make a difference in the lives of the people around us. God, give us the courage and the faith to step out beyond ourselves. Would you speak to our hearts this morning, God? Would you stir our hearts Would you bring us so much discomfort, Lord, that that we are compelled to use the gifts that you gave us to love those around us, to make a difference in their lives, and to glorify you in all that we do. We pray this in the name of the one who gave us the perfect work, your son, our Savior, Jesus. And everyone said, go ahead and be seated. Nehemiah is is one of those characters in Scripture that is motivating, captivating. Uh, The story of Nehemiah is, is inspirational because he's just this ordinary guy from the Old Testament that we've all heard of, right? He's this ordinary guy that we all heard of that, that makes this extraordinary difference. What I like about Nehemiah is he's not a pastor. He wasn't a priest. He wasn't a king. He wasn't even a prophet. He wasn't a warrior. He was just an everyday guy with a decent job. That's who he was, just an everyday guy with a decent job. He was an ordinary person that heard something, and when he heard that, it broke his heart and crushed his spirit to a point that he was compelled to do something about it. He needed to make a difference in the world around him. You don't know what Nehemiah did for a living. Nehemiah was the cupbearer to the king of Persia. Now you may say, what in the world is a cupbearer? Okay, good question. Think of a cupbearer being maybe like a butler today. Okay? Think of him being like an equivalent to to a, 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 a butler today. He was was incredibly trusted in his role to the king because if you can imagine, this guy has all access to the king of Persia. If the king's having a private conversation, we need to attack this and we need to do this and we need to do that, these conversations that change the lives of millions of people, this cupbearer would be standing there and would hear all of that. So the person would be, need to be trustworthy, full of integrity, incredibly loyal. Because of his job title, one of the most important things the cupbearer would do is 
taste the wine of the king. Don't worry about this. It was grape juice. No, it wasn't, but we'll go on about that later. He would taste the wine of the king before the king would actually drink it. That way they could see if the wine was poisoned or not. I don't know, but if I'm the guy tasting the wine, I want good insurance. I'm just saying. I want some real benefits. Because if you're out of a job, you're really out of a job. You know what I'm saying? So this guy was an ordinary person, not in a role of status, but in a role of a servant attending to the needs of the king. One day, Nehemiah was just going about the business of doing his job. It was a day unlike today. It was just a normal day, and Nehemiah was just doing his job. He was just going about his life and doing his job. It was just an ordinary day, kind of, kind of like I said before today. And if you go back to Nehemiah chapter 1, we'll start in verses 1 and 2. It says, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Halakai. Now it happened in the month of Shislev, in the twelfth year, while I was in Susa, the capital. And Hanani, one of the brothers, and some men from Judah came. And I asked them about the Jews who had escaped and survived the captivity and about Jerusalem. In other words, Nehemiah is sitting down with his brother and he says, Tell me about our people. Tell me about the Jewish remnant that is still living in Jerusalem. And they're having this conversation. And, 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 and this is what had happened 400 and, or 140 years prior to this move, prior to this moment, is the Babylonians came in and, and, and ransacked Jerusalem. And the evil king Nebuchadnezzar attacked the Jewish people and completely demolished their culture, their life. In everything around them. Anyone heard of Solomon's temple? It was destroyed at this time. 140 years before Nehemiah was having this conversation. Every building in Jerusalem was in rubble. The gates of the city which were formed to protect the city were burned to the ground. Almost everyone that they knew was now without a job, without any kind of hope. And so the evil Babylonians took the Jewish people captive. They took them away from their homeland and held them in bondage for a long time. And you can imagine that the Jewish people at this time felt demoralized and hopeless. What are we going to do? We have no homeland. Our life is over. What are we going to do? Life around us looks totally different now. What are we going to do? Decades later, 50,000 or so Jewish people moved back to Jerusalem to rebuild. We're going to rebuild the city that we love, our homeland, and we're going to try to make a better future. The problem is they couldn't find themselves a way to move forward. They found themselves stalled and completely dead. And we go on to Nehemiah 1, verse 3, and it says, And they said to me, The remnant there in the province who survived the captivity, are in great distress and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broke, broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. In other words, there's, there's no way to protect our city. How can we build our city back up if we don't even have walls to protect ourselves? There's no jobs, there's no economic system, there's no leadership, there's no direction, there's no confidence. With no protection, there's no plan, and there's no hope whatsoever. What do you do when you don't know what to do? Have you ever been there in your life? What do you do when you don't know what to do? What do you do when you don't know what to do? What do you do when you see something, thank you, that breaks your heart? You know there's a good work that needs to be done. And you think perhaps you're supposed to be a part of God's work, but you don't know what that is. 
What do you do when you look around? I really needed that, thank you. What do you do when you look around and you see something that bothers you deeply and you can't take it anymore? Let me give you a few thoughts that, and a few things that Nehemiah did. And let's relate to that and let's do that in our lives. The first thing Nehemiah did when he heard the story of his people, the plight of his people, what did Nehemiah do? The first thing Nehemiah did is he sat down and he cried. I know some of the men are like, not doing that. <clears throat> I'm a man. Tim, do you cry? I know you do. Cry, baby. <laughs> oh, I, that was on the mic. I'm sorry. Oops. First thing we must do is sit down and cry. When we look around in this world, what breaks our hearts? What breaks our hearts? When we see things, what breaks our hearts? You're saying, Pastor, not a lot of things break my heart. I look around the world and it seems as though there's not much that breaks our hearts. You can get on and see videos of shootings and fights. You can see all of these things and you can read comments by people celebrating what had happened. What breaks our hearts? Nehemiah says, in verse 4, now when I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. I sat down and I wept and mourned for days. It crushed him. It broke his heart. Nehemiah was about a thousand miles away from his homeland. He was living a relatively comfortable life. He was living in the palace. Think about it. He's eating the same food that the king's eating. He's watching the same TV shows that the king is watching. He has the king's Netflix password, Mom and Donnie. Just saying. Bishop, yeah. He was posting selfies with a filter on Facebook every week. <laughs> Hashtag blessed life. <laughs> It'll be better when I'm down on the beach. This guy is living a completely comfortable life. I don't know about you, but sometimes in the comfort of my couch, I can be scrolling down and see something and I, and I see something and I go oh that's terrible and I just continue scrolling am I the only one am I the only one that watches the news and sees something terrible and then three minutes later I don't even think about it again the question I have this morning is what breaks your heart see Nehemiah had a choice when he heard the story of his people and the everyday choice, the, the, the acceptable choice by everyone around him, the, the, the right thing to do according to the world was, was, man, that would be awful. What a shame. Hate to hear it. That's awful. I feel really bad for them, but I'm so blessed because my life is great. But it crushed Nehemiah's heart to the point where his soul started to stir. And God gave him a divine, a divine burden, an ache in his soul. And when he heard the news, he didn't do what was easy to do and brush it off. He sat down and he broke down and he started to cry. What breaks our hearts, church family? when we look around at a community that don't know Jesus Christ, does that break our hearts? When thousands of souls are drawing their last breath on this earth, right as we preach, right as we are learning God's word this morning, when thousands of people are dying without a saving relationship with Jesus Christ, does that truly break our hearts? 
does it break our hearts? What burdens you? What creates righteous anger on the behalf of God for you? What does that look like? What injustice do you see going on in the world that breaks your heart? When you see something that reaches at you and tugs at your soul, uh, when you see this and, and you ask the question, why doesn't somebody do something about this? When you look at the empty seats week after week after week in our churches, what breaks our hearts? What breaks our hearts? Maybe for you it's hurting children, right? Maybe it's children who's been bullied or neglected or abused. Maybe for you it's uh, 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 those who are bound by an addiction. That breaks your heart. Maybe it's those who are hostage to drugs. Maybe it's homelessness. Maybe it's people that, that, that are stuck in life and, and, and just can't meet their everyday me needs. Maybe it's those who's been trafficked and abused their whole life. Maybe it's those who are impoverished and don't have clean drinking water or, or, or a simple mosquito net around their bed at night. Maybe it's those in another part of the world that don't have access to medicine. Maybe it's your neighbor that you hear fighting one another every day and verbally abusing their children or their spouse. What breaks your heart? Maybe seeing people beaten down who can't stand up for themselves breaks your heart. What burdens your soul? What burdens your soul? Instead of scrolling past that in our everyday lives, I believe we need to stop, we need to sit down, and boy, we just need a good cry. We need to let the Spirit of God soften our hearts. Another thing we need to do is kneel down and pray. Now, when I heard these words, I sat down and I wept and mourned for days, and I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Listen, church, if it's big enough to cry about, it's certainly big enough to pray about. Amen? Sometimes we just say the most insulting things to our God. We say things like, you know what? You're at a point now, you're at a point now where all we can do is pray. Tim, all we can do is pray for you. How many times have we said, oh, just all we can do is really? Boy, we don't have a true grasp on what prayer is, do we? That's all the power, brother. That's all the power. Prayer is a main reason why you beat cancer. Prayer is the main reason why we're together as one church. That's the power of prayer. going on in verse 5 and at 6 and I said it says I said please Lord God of heaven the great and awesome God who keeps the covenant and faithfulness for those who love him and keep his commandments let your ear now be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant which I am praying before you now day and night on behalf of the sons of Israel your servants confessing the sins of the sons of Israel which have committed been committed against you and I in my father's house have sinned Nehemiah confesses his own sin he confesses the sins of his people and he reminds God of God's promises and faithfulness in verse 11 it says please Lord may your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and the prayer of your servants who delight to revere your name and please make your servant successful today and grant him mercy before this man. He's going to talk to the king because he has a mission to do. 
Oh, we need to sit down and pray. We need to cry about the things that break our hearts. We need to fast for direction. Fasting, uh uh-oh. Talking about fasting on Donut Sunday. Better get a man. Better get a man. We must not forget to fast when we seek God's will, protection, direction, and provision. Now, fasting is one of those things, church family, that's, that's highly misunderstood. And the rare times that we as a church have called to fast, what I get from 99% of the people who come and ask me, Pastor, I can't fast. I, I have a condition that allows me, that, that, that keeps me from fasting. Well, there's a few different fasts that you can do. We'll run through them very quick. You see that Paul did an absolute fast and in, in, the, in the book of Acts. That means he didn't eat or drink anything. He didn't eat or drink anything for three days. Some of you are going, I can't do that. Okay, you, that's fine. That's fine, you can't do that. There's a partial fast, that's more of a diet. Whew. <laughs> a partial fast is a restriction of a food, or maybe it's a restriction off social media. Whoo, wouldn't that be great? Maybe you fast for social media because your heart's been hardened by the things you've seen around you. And maybe you need God to speak to you so you make a choice to fast off social media. Besides the Journey Facebook page. Just kidding. Daniel did this to receive revelation from Christ. Jesus models what I would call a normal fast that we find in the Gospel of Luke. It's a total abstinence from food, but yet, but yet he drinks. I'm asking today to allow your heart to be broken for what God gives you a burden for. I'm asking that if you're a part of this church to commit to fasting before we publicly launch on Easter. You say, well, what kind? Of? You choose the fasting you want to do. You choose the fasting that works for you. You choose that and you choose the amount of time that you fast. And do me a favor when you're fasting, please don't whine about it. Please don't post about it. You can fast for two days and then start whining about it and share it with everyone else and you just, you shouldn't have even fasted in the first place. I'm going to ask you to do that. I'm going to ask you to fast for God's direction on what he wants to use you for and the ministry that he's called you to. I want you to fast that the leaders of this church are wise and righteous in the eyes of the Lord, that we allow ourselves to lead in God's grace. I want want you to fast for unity in our church. I promise you will experience God in a deeper way when you do. So how do you begin to get to work when you can't take it anymore? You let the things of this world into your heart. You sit down and cry. You kneel and you pray and you fast. And finally, you make the decision to stand up to act. You make the decision to stand up and act. Nehemiah takes the cup and goes to visit the king. His heart is heavy, and the king can tell that. So in verse 4, the king says to them, What would you request? So I prayed to the Lord of heaven, and I said to the king, If it pleases the king, if your servant has found favor before you, I request that you send me to Judah for the city of my father, to the city of my father's tombs, that I might rebuild it. He asked to go to rebuild the city. My people are hurting. The walls are torn down. The city's exposed. And you know what, boss? I just can't take it anymore. It's time for me to stand up. Just one ordinary guy. It's time for me to stand up. Just one. Just one man. 
Has anyone ever heard the name Irina Sindler? She was a Polish woman. Yeah. We'll go into that later on, Sawatsky. Got plenty of jokes after church. But she was a Polish woman who grew up in Nazi occupied Poland. She lived in the outskirts of Warsaw. She was 29 years old when the Nazis captured Poland. She was a Catholic. Oh my goodness, am I talking good about a Catholic this morning? Oh my goodness, yeah. Catholics are in heaven too. Just saying. She was part of a group called Zagoda. They were an underground group. And what they specialized in doing was trying to feed and help the Jewish people escape from the ghettos that the Nazis had set up. On the edge of this town was this beautiful church that the Nazis let be opened up and, and they let the Jewish people and let those that wanted to help the Jewish people with their medical needs. And what she specialized in is she would take the children in this ghetto. And she would fake medical needs. She even faked papers saying that she was a nurse so she could do these things. She would take them by stretcher. She would take them by any means necessary to the church. She would keep them there for days. And because of where the church was positioned physically, she would sneak them out of the church falsifying reports. And she would free Jewish children. And every child she freed, she would take their names and write them down on a little piece of toilet paper and put them in glass bottles. Cap these glass bottles and bury them outside of the city limits. She did this because she wanted to make for sure that the children would get reunited with their parents after the war. Sadly, about 98% of the parents after the war were killed in concentration camps. She was just a little, uh, a, 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 a little unassuming woman motivated by the Lord Jesus Christ. She was so committed to the rescue of Jewish children that she was one of the most wanted criminals of the Nazi party in 1943. She was captured by the Nazis. They took sledgehammers to her knees and ankles and legs. They did all unspeakable acts to her of torture, trying to get her to reveal the people in the network she was working with. She never gave up. She never gave up. She continued rescuing, rescuing children all the way up to the end of the war. By the time the war ended, she had rescued over 2,500 children. Just an ordinary woman doing the extraordinary work of Jesus Christ. A woman with zero resources. A woman who was considered a second-class citizen in her society. And you see stories like Nehemiah. We see stories of Irene Sadler. We hear these. We see events around our lives. We see people lost and broken. We see injustice. We see those without Jesus Christ, without hope.
God has called us ordinary people to something extraordinary. I ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. No one behind you. You are here for a reason today. Not by mistake, not by accident. God has placed you here at this moment for a very specific reason. And that reason is for you to serve him. But in order to serve him, in order, in order to, to do something extraordinary for the kingdom, you have to be a child of his. You have to be a believer in Jesus Christ. Your head's bowed and eyes closed. If you're sitting here this morning and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, Pastor Eric and I will be up front. We want to pray with you. We want to help you understand how you can be a follower of Jesus. If you're sitting here this morning and you're a follower of Jesus Christ, but for years you have settled for ordinary, and you believe with all your heart that He's called you to something extraordinary, Will you sit down and cry? Will you pray and fast? Once you do all those things, will you commit in the name of Jesus Christ to stand up and witness the hope that is found in Him? Heavenly Father, this morning, for those that are watching online and for those that are in this sanctuary today, Lord, I pray that you stir our hearts. I pray that you crush our souls. As we replant, Lord, we see what you can do with one person, Lord. And I pray for the unity within this body, Lord, to impact this community, to impact our families, to impact our friends and our co-workers in such a way that we see a spirit uh, of you, Lord, move in ways that we've never seen before. That we commit to share the good news to those around us. We commit to bringing people to the foot of the cross. To see lives transformed. Will you make that commitment? I'm going to give you just a moment to pray this morning. Pastor Eric and I will be up front here to pray with you for any needs you might have. Let's sing this song of worship.